Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 106, recorded on February 24th, 2021. The Cloud Pod disagrees with Gartner on low code. Good evening, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. How's it going this week? Great. How you doing? Ah, you know, it's been an interesting week in cloud as usual. Solar winds, you know, testimony at the Congress, all kinds of fun stuff. So lots to cover tonight as usual. How about uh, Ryan and Peter, how is it going in your parts of the world? Uh, it finally warmed up here in Kansas City. Got a 75 degree upswing that made it just warm enough to get outside yesterday, which was wonderful. It's practically summer here. It's freaking weird outside. <laughs> I have no idea yeah, what's I, going on. Texas froze, <laughs> as Texas froze to death, we're all like, it's 70 <laughs> degrees here. It's no... All those people who moved from California to Texas recently are probably regretting that decision. Yeah. At this moment. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at that actually. It didn't take many people moving to Idaho from this area to push the house prices up like crazy. So I don't imagine many people are going to move to Austin yeah. before it gets what? even more expensive either. Well, Austin was when super there's... expensive before all those people moved there. Like I was looking at it a couple of years ago, thinking about moving, and I was like, it's just as expensive as it is in Seattle or the Bay. Why would I make this change? Because Austin's awesome. Yeah. And that's even without the $10,000 electric bills. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Well, a few weeks ago, we talked about solar winds and the hack that basically happened. And, you know, Microsoft has apparently admitted this week that they apparently got access to not only this into Microsoft systems, but also the source code for parts of Azure, Exchange, and Intune. Intune being probably the most damaging because that's their endpoint protection product. And basically, these products are, you know, some of the code was downloaded, which means it could allow the hackers even more freedom to hunt for security vulnerabilities find new flaws or examine the logic to find ways to exploit you much better. Currently, the breaches have impacted nine federal agencies and over 100 private customers per U.S. authority. And uh, President Joe Biden has apparently promised to respond to the SolarWinds hack in a very serious way. And an inquiry and remediation effort is being led by his top security official, Deputy NSA Advisor, and Neuberger. There was a congressional hearing yesterday. I didn't really hear anything that was you know, revolutionary. As most of these congressional hearings are, they don't really have good technical questions that I would have asked, <laughs> but uh, you know, they're good questions for politicians who know nothing about technology, but uh, there was a few little tidbits here or there, but once we get a good summary, we'll maybe cover that next week a little further, unless uh, Jonathan's got something as he perked up. I was just going to say, it'd be useful if people asking questions understood the, the answers. I always wonder what the point is asking questions in these hearings when you really don't understand the, the answers anyway. You just sound Usually you- the question is in a form of a political statement. That just makes your point before it doesn't matter what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, the questions are really weird in congressional hearings. It is, it is a strange. So if there's something interesting, I'll, I'll cover that next week. Uh, oh, the weirdest thing about that is uh, AWS apparently were invited to take part in the hearing and declined. Was it Marco Rubio made some comment about how AWS were too busy to attend? I'm like, well, what does it have to do with AWS anyway? I mean, that's, I mean, as, as technology leaders or thought leaders, I can see why they might be asked to give their two cents or something but not it was nothing to do with them so so being slighted by not showing up to thing which they were not involved with is i mean i don't know Marco Rubio, yeah i, I don't think you know i think amazon the more they can stay out of the mix of these conversations right now the better off they're going to be with some of the antitrust scrutiny they've got underneath it's like should have given us jedi <laughs> <laughs> no upside all downside yeah. for yeah. them to show up to that thing exactly well gardner apparently has decided to tell us that low code market is entering hyper growth spurred mostly by COVID. They're saying that last year, low code development tool growth grew over 23% to 13.8 billion driven in a surge of do it yourself projects initiated by to respond to COVID-19. I also like to note that Gartner didn't necessarily call them citizen developer market, <laughs> but they do classify their low code app development as a very specific type of low code. And I'll go into that in just a second. They say low code app development is being characterized by model driven or visual development paradigms, along with expression languages, the time scripting, which will make up 42% of the market this next year. They kind of market heavyweights, including Microsoft, Oracle and service now, but no mention of AWS or Google being a heavyweight in this particular space. So despite the acquisition Google has done and AWS's Honeycode product, apparently that's not making the dent to Gartner. They break low code into several technology categories, including low code app platforms, intelligent business process management suites, multi-experience development platforms, robotic process automation, citizen automation and development platform, son of a gun, (laughs) so close, and other low code development technologies 
all available to you from the Gartner site. So, uh, you know, because we are such big fans of low code and no code solutions, I figured we'd talk about the fact that apparently Gartner is saying this is big time growth, 23%. I'm surprised they don't have Apple in there as being the thought leaders in this whole low-code thing. Didn't didn't they, like in macOS 9 or 8, even have the automator, which is supposed to watch you performing repeated actions in macOS and then offer ways to automate those clicks to do things? That seems to be the kind of low-code they're talking about. That still exists, too. It's it's in the latest version. I still can't get it to work. Uh, But uh, (laughs) 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 I try every once in a while. Nope, still don't like it. Way, way, way back in my Mac. My first computer was a Mac SE. And we used to have HyperCard. And that was really the dawn of no code, if you really want to get into it. Because <laughs> that was, you know, you could write this really cool little animations that were across multiple screens and action flows. It was, it was pretty neat, even back then, running on Mac SE with no RAM and no CPU power. It was pretty, pretty impressive. I just see, like, the people who created things like FileMaker Pro just being like, I told you! It was coming. <laughs> FileMaker Pro. Oh, wow. Have you ever tried to use FileMaker Pro? <laughs> oh, my it's... God. I wrote so many apps in FileMaker Pro and MS Access. I did a lot of access programs, but I, every time I try to get into FileMaker Pro, I'm like, I hate everything about this, and I abandon it very quickly. If I remember correctly, the FileMaker Pro to FileMaker Pro 2.0, the big thing they did that helped me was they allowed you to use if statements in the tiny bit of code you write. Before that, you couldn't. So you had to like click this button if you want to do one thing and click that button for something else because there's no if. Did it support tagging by chance? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to troll on their Amazon account reps and ask for a Paradox serverless. <laughs> Fox Pro. <laughs> Fox, Fox Pro, yeah. Pro. <laughs> uh, Actually, I think Amazon should be right on the top of this no-code development thing. I mean, they have the whole Mechanical Turk setup where you just literally type in words what you want somebody to do and people are prepared to do work for you know five cents per click or something, You know, clicking on sites or looking at images and classifying things. That's got to be the ultimate low-code solution. It's an interesting model in general, the whole you know, manual AI tuning paradigm that basically empowers interesting space. Yeah, I guess that's probably why Gartner's going so far to define what they mean by low code is just because there's so many different, yeah. you know, interpretations you can put on that, you know. Yeah, but I, I do feel Honeycode is a low code app platform. Amazon does have a robotic process automation capability because we talked about the robot kit thing before. They do have, you know, sort of business process management suites, which is really about taking data from one system and converting it to another. They have Glue. They've got a bunch of other solutions for this type of transformation. So there, many of the things they mention, Amazon actually does have. So does Google and so does Azure. Yeah. Like um, Google so. Sheets. Yeah. I think so it's a little weird that they weren't mentioned to the leader, but it's not a magic quadrant. So I guess I can't complain too much. Maybe just, you know, Oracle paid them more money to have their name mentioned. I think that's how it works. Gardner, pay to play. <laughs> AWS is going to provide the National Hockey League the cloud AI and machine learning services, which is a story that I'm sure makes Ryan and Peter and I very, very happy, and Jonathan maybe a little <laughs> less so. And he and he he's shown his displeasure already by turning off his camera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This deal that they have announced will become the official cloud AI and ML infrastructure provider with the largest ice hockey league in North America. Under the deal, AWS will enable the NHL to automate video processing and content delivery in the cloud and leverage its puck and player tracking systems to capture more details of gameplay for fans, teams, and media partners. They'll also be building an enterprise video platform to aggregate video, data, and related applications into one central repository that make it easier for announcers to pull up archival footage to show different examples of things they're talking about. They highlighted Machine Learning's lab, AWS Elemental, Amazon Kinesis, Amazon SageMaker, and they have done a similar deal like this to the NFL. If you were watching Super Bowl, you saw all those Powered by AWS commercials that they did. Although on the NHL side, I don't think the money is really in the TV commercial rights because there's it's on a really weird channel when you do watch it on TV. But maybe it's the fact that uh, Andy Jassy is part owner of the new Seattle Kraken team. Wow, yeah. oh, I didn't know he was just part of, part of this uh, part of this uh, announcement here on this one. And Andy Jassy is quoted in the article: AWS is working with the world's most renowned sports leagues to better understand their data and innovate upon it using our deep portfolio of machine learning services. With this agreement, AWS will provide our industry-leading cloud technology to the NHL, becoming a foundational partner in delivering NHL performance analytics and collaborating to enhance the way people would experience hockey by providing more engaging content and greater insights to fans. I saw a public preview of this like the, presented by the press. It was kind of neat just to see it. You know, like I like how you're starting to see these computer you know, technologies sort of enhance viewer experience. And so it's, you know, it's largely you know, video tracking of players and then, you know, the presentation of stats about that player. But all done sort of, you know, dynamically, which I think used to be done by, you know, 
armies of people and teleprompters and you know it's kind of neat i'd be hopeful that they because if you watch like hockey to me is the one sport that everybody says you got to be there live to watch it and i think that one of the main reasons they say that is that it's tv's responsibility to keep that close up angle on the puck and the puck carrier but when you're at the game conservation momentum is so important that you can see players building speed and directions they're going and then you see the drop pass and all of a sudden this guy's flying through and picks up the puck and you like I couldn't imagine the videographers being able to anticipate that. And I'm wondering if this would actually change the way they present it the entire game on TV, like knowing proactively when to pull out and wide angle because there's something else going on that it would have been impossible for someone to decide, you know, at an instant to make that decision. But a computer can make that algorithm determine, foresee it coming and pull out and see the whole play. So that'd be cool. That would be cool. I remember still the glowing puck. Uh, was, <laughs> ah, yes. This was a big thing. And I used to really oh, like yeah. that. But they, you know, the problem at the time was it was so expensive to use the glowing puck and they would want to trade it out when it got kind of knocked into the stands. Well, and people hated uh, it. But you know, now with the, like it was universally. Yeah, and I, it wasn't that terrible, I didn't think. It just, you know, it was expensive and had some other issues. But, you know, that was the idea with that too, is that you could hit a wider angle shot and with the glowing puck, you'd be able to see where the puck was still to see the kind of stuff. It never really worked, fortunately, TV. That's interesting. My favorite part about that was that they, when they announced it, all the players started complaining that they can tell a difference in the puck. And then they broke the bad news to the players that they had swapped out the puck six months earlier. (laughs) (laughs) Specifically knowing that, you know, finicky elite athletes are going to be like, hey, I don't like it. (laughs) Yep. Sorry, you've been playing with it for six months. You didn't complain once. You're fine. (laughs) Well, now with all of the issues they've got with player and fan safety, they've basically netted the entire, you know, rinks now versus before they used to the ends. So, I mean, now one of the big concerns was the cost of those pucks. That's now kind of gone away, too. They could come, they could bring them back, maybe virtually. You know, never know. Use machine learning to track the puck versus an actual technical radio. So. I was always impressed with uh, sports commentators who know all the players' names by the shirts and the numbers on the shirts they're wearing and things like that. Wouldn't it be cool to, to see machine vision and AI get to a place where you could actually have the machine provide the sports commentary without a person being involved at all. Watching the game progress, talking mm-hmm. about the plays. I mean, at least in play hockey, play. the names yeah. are super complicated, so that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the problem, though, is that the funnest part about hockey is that it's not the name that matters, it's the nickname yes, that matters. Exactly. <laughs> la 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 Fontaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that's, you know, since broadcasters can no longer travel with the teams on road games, I wonder if that's, you know, are they as up to knowledge with the uh, the ins and outs of the sports going on? Do they know all the nicknames? I mean, I feel like to be in that type of job, your entire life is hockey. You do nothing but watch hockey and know the hockey player names. Like, you know, for you or I or, you know, an average just hockey players, you know, fan, you know, to know all those players, I probably wouldn't know most of them. But, you know, like. Then you have things like fantasy football or fantasy hockey, where now you maybe know a little bit better. So I know since fantasy football came out, I know a lot more player names than I ever used to know for other teams other than the one I follow. But, you know, in your day and day job is just nothing but knowing hockey and watching tape of hockey. I think you get pretty good at the names. Oh, they know the names. That's yeah. what we need. We need to get names. in the, like a public sage maker or other endpoint so that, you know, I can use these statistics to feed my fantasy hockey team. Million dollar idea. I'm going to call who it Andy. Funding, who do you think is funding the research? <laughs> <laughs> My first experience at the hockey game, by the way, was in Phoenix. And I was serving nachos and cheese from a stand to raise money for charity. Nice. Oh, that's so awesome. You, so you didn't see the game. You just saw the, the fans. I saw the game, but not during the intermission when there was no game. And I was selling that's just some cheese. And this guy came and asked me for jalapenos. And I'm here, like, being in the country for literally, like, four months. You know, we don't do spice in England, not that kind of spice. Anyway, we have in- hot Indian spices and things, not Mexican spices. Jalapenos. Jal- what, the f- what, the- what the hell's jalapenos? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what jalapenos yeah. is. <laughs> I mean, I know what jalapenos yeah. are. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's are like, you got any jalapenos? I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like an Italian ice cream? Like, mm. yeah. uh, good uh, times. That is good times. 
All right. Well, moving on to announcement that I'm going to have to lean on Ryan a little bit to help with. <laughs> so HashiCorp is announcing the general availability of the HashiCorp Terraform Cloud Operator for Kubernetes. This is apparently the GA of the Terraform Cloud Operator for Kubernetes announced in March 2020. They've been expanding on the original ideas, but this is basically a way to make Terraform Cloud workspaces be managed through Kubernetes custom resource definitions, or CRDs. And they've also expanded this to take advantage of the Terraform Cloud API. Since they released this in alpha in March last year, they've added several new features, including VCS-backed workspaces, and is a, more, is a powerful first step in enabling your GitOps workflow with Terraform and Kubernetes. The Terraform Cloud agents, which allow communication with isolated private or on-premise infrastructures like vSphere, Nutanix, or OpenStack. They took config maps and migrated them to secrets for better alignment with the Kubernetes security framework, as well as the operator now also supports Terraform Enterprise by just specifying the URL for that. And you can also install this via Helm, which if you're into the Helm ecosystem. So Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you because after that, I can't talk about yeah. this one. Well, when they announced this in March, I remember just being really confused. Like, why would you want to deploy a Terraform workspace with Kubernetes? It didn't make any sense to me at the time. And so this is one of those things that after that announcement, I sort of dug in a little bit and I played around with it. And so, and then sort of forgot about it completely. You know, the workflows that are coming out of these Kubernetes shops are very, you know, GitOps focused, like we said. And so you always end up having with any app in the cloud space, a dependency on an external resource, whether that's a database or maybe it's just a data store or a file that you need to update or it could be anything. And so it's always this problem where you have, you know, disjointed deployment processes where you want to deploy your new app, but then you got to go to some other mechanism to, you know, create the S3 bucket or, or whatever it is. And so this is the answer to that, which is, it's not an obvious way to do it, but it does make sense. You configure your Terraform code alongside your source code, just like you would in any GitOps sort of operation. And then with these, you know, either Cube Control or Helm or however you want to do it, you basically create the workspace pointed at that VCS connection for the creation of those resources. So it allows you basically to have a single method of input for your application deployment when you're primarily focused around managing the containerized parts of that infrastructure. It's an interesting solution to a very hard problem, one that's prevented me from really adopting Kubernetes in mass just because applications are more than just containers. Right. There's always that trick, right, where you're like, okay, we're going to totally separate infrastructure from application deploys. And then the new version of the app requires different infrastructure, and you have to tie those two together. And we struggle with that all the time. You know, how do you do you separate tooling? All of these tools are trying to get you to use them to do everything. And, you know, do you do that or do you separate them? You can't separate them. Yeah, it's always a challenge. Yeah. I mean, the benefit of GitOps, what, I think why people like it and why it's taking off is that it does centralize that deployment, right? So it's all your reviews, all of your feedback, your discussion, your developer interaction, as well as your Terraform plans and your Helm deploys, all that is visualized directly in that Git pull and pull request sort of workflow. So it's really powerful to do that. And you see a lot of companies going in that direction. But then these are the pain points. And so it's an interesting space to be in right now. Well, this is officially the 106th episode and something that has never occurred on the show ever before has occurred this week. And that is the fact that Amazon did not announce anything that we typically would put into the main show for Amazon. The other typical things we put into the lightning round. And so I have dug deep and I have declared these next few stories from the lightning round as worthy of the main show, just so we didn't have to not talk about AWS. But they have actually not announced anything on the new announcement blog since the Flutter announcement last week. We talked about on the show last week, and we said it was a little light. Then it's still very light. And so the first one up is uh, Amazon EC2 Mac instances will now support Mac OS Big Sur, which... Is great. And, you know, something we said was kind of silly that they just announced the new Mac OS EC2 instances at reInvent and did not support Big Sur, which I come out, you know, a month and a half before that, or two months at that point. So you can now run all of your native Mac OS builds on the Mac OS Big Sur EC2 instances for all your Xcode 12.5 needs. I stunned you with the first one. Stunned you with the first yeah. one. I was never, like, super upset, like, when they don't support the latest and greatest version of Kubernetes because the, those features usually... You shouldn't need right away for production workloads. But if you're using EC2 Mac instances, you're using them for testing and you need to test on the platforms that your customers are running on. So this is paramount importance. 
Well, if you want to ship iOS apps, they need to be built on the latest version of Xcode yeah. and the latest version of macOS because that's how Apple does it. They deprecate those SDKs. Um, yeah. So not only do you need the current it, version, but you probably need some sort of preview access, you know, to, in order to do it. Yeah, properly. correct. Actually, yes, you do. And those are things that I've done many times using other Mac server hosters. As you saw the beta version on one of your build nodes, and that way you can do the build, you know, pre-builds of the new operating system, etc. The next thing I thought was worthy of AWS <laughs> section of the news show was that Amazon EC2 auto scaling now shows you the scaling history of a deleted group, which now means you can view the deleted auto scaling group in the scaling history. Previously, if you deleted that auto scaling group, you lost the circle data. And I only really chose this because A, I was riveted by it. It's amazing. But number two, this actually has burned me a couple times with Terraform where I've killed an auto scaling group and then go, well, hey, what was this parameter? Like, what was the peak admin I needed? And, you know, I wanted to go actually look at historical data and I'd already Terraform destroyed it. And so that was kind of a bummer. So I am, this does actually solve a problem for me in one very small, not that annoying use case, but you know, there you go. That's why I graduated to AWS news. I have definitely run into this in the same sort of thing where it's like, it's not working. I don't know why it's not working. Destroy everything. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, what was it set to? Wait, wait, wait. how many nodes did I have before I destroyed it? Well, then you try to figure out root cause of why it's not working. You're like, (laughs) Uh oh. I didn't really specify in the article how long the history would be there. So I don't assume it's forever, but I assume it's for some, you know, some period greater than one, but less than probably a week or two. That's my guess. So I have a theory. I think Jeff Barr is on vacation and then everyone else is just, ah, ooh, is just like, nah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I kind of thought, That's so actually I'd held back the show notes from you guys today because I was like, well, you know, today is the big ML day event today. Maybe they're going to announce a bunch of ML stuff today. And they just been kind of like then nothing happened other than they announced GA for lookout for vision, which we weren't going to talk about on the show anyways, because no one cares about manufacturing here and for the vision product. But, you know, it's definitely going to be, you know, it's interesting how quiet they've been. Like you have to wonder kind of what their plan is here. Like maybe they've, maybe they're just really doing a lot of planning for the rest of the year or, or something else. But, you know, we also complained about Azure sort of in that boat last year at one point GCP was in that boat and maybe just took longer for AWS to kind of burn down their roadmap of stuff, <laughs> you know, through reinvent and now they're just kind of rebuilding back up. I don't know. It was one of our best listening to episodes actually was, uh, is you're in GCP. Are you okay? <laughs> 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 I remember that. <laughs> yeah. We could have made this one AWS. Yeah. Are you okay? Maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll do that next week. If this, if this trend continues. <laughs> so, well, going to GCP, you know, they had announcements, maybe not quite as exciting or at the same level as the AWS ones, because the first one up is uh, schedule based auto scaling is now available to you in the GCP cloud. Ideally, you would auto scale your infrastructure based on a metric like CPU, memory, other other some other better metric than those two. But sometimes it takes too long for your machine to scale up due to prerequisites or app configuration updates that take a very long time. And this is particularly an issue around like a marketing campaign that you're sending off at 10 o'clock and you can't wait for the servers to scale up when you know you're gonna have a whole bunch of traffic coming back in. So it'd be great if you could tell the autoscaler to spin up more VMs in anticipation of those busy periods. And now you can with the compute engine introducing schedule-based autoscaling to let you improve the availability of your workloads by scheduling capacity ahead of the anticipated model. If you're running a workload on a managed instance group, you can schedule the required number of virtual machines instances for recurring load patterns as well as one-off events. I was a little curious if this is something you can only do if you didn't have normal auto scaling and dug into documentation. And the answer is yes, you can use this with normal auto scaling. And in fact, it actually requires you to have a normal auto scaling policy first. So you have to have a CPU or other load balancing metric set up first, and then you can do the scheduling by time. Uh, you can have only 128 scaling schedules per uh, managed instance group, and the minimum duration for a, school, a scaling schedule is five minutes. So this is not a quick fix. Again, you know, like if you're launching a marketing campaign, why can't you just make an API call to the system in advance of your marketing campaign to increase the size of your group? There's other ways you could do this. And then you know, the fact that, you know, the big AI ML company that Google is doesn't have automation to help you figure this out automatically through AI ML is kind of a miss on my opinion as well. But uh, if this is something you were looking for and you needed, GCP has caught up with, I think, pretty much Azure and AWS who had this for at least five years at this point. I'm sort of coming around on it. You know, it's partially because of my in my day job, my workload is extremely predictable. And so it's one of those things that I really could tell you what time to scale right now based on yeah. historical load. So, you know. We need 12 instances in the daytime and we need two at night. And we know that because it's been like that for three years and we don't want to figure out the metrics right now and worry about that. We just want to migrate to the cloud and make sure there's 12 up from nine to six and two up from six to nine. Or we'll just use service <laughs> and have a no scale per event. Yeah, lift and shift to serverless. 
that. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> I mean, Google has that converter that takes an instance and converts it to a container, right? You just it's fine. We're serverless. Everything's it's fine. fine. Serverless, we're done. You just have this vision of a solitary like pizza box just sitting directly on the data center floor. <laughs> that's, that's rackless, yeah. I think. It sounds like rackless. To clarify for this next article, we're going to talk about VMware instances, not Google Compute instances, because I like to be confused. Google Cloud VMware Engine has had several features added to help support VMware use cases on top of the Google Cloud. The first up is improved networking support, which now supports the multi-region networking natively in your vSphere cluster, connectivity from multiple VPCs, cloud DNS for management across global deployments, end-to-end dynamic routing, and support for reserved blocks as well as non-private IP addresses all in VMware. They've also improved the scalability and support for VMware platform, including vSAN version 7 and NSX-T 3.0 support, larger clusters, because you all want to make larger VMware clusters, don't you? HCX, HCX migration support, ESXi host configuration retention, and enhanced password management, as well as they've expanded out to Montreal and Sao Paulo for your interest. If you're interested in VMware on cloud, Google is offering you a limited time 12% discount on all VMware engine SKUs with a new agreement signed between you and Google. So that is available to you if you're using VMware on the cloud from Google. Well, I haven't used VMware in quite a while, but I think at the at least at the VMware level, you had to pre-allocate resources to use. And so scalability and support, you know, it's while you can make the VMs utilize that stuff, it used to be very tricky to do at the VMware level, which wasn't a problem when you're in the data center and you have finite compute. And, you know, the Google and the... Azure VMware support are slightly different than the one that they built for Amazon, right? Amazon one is very t-shirt sized and very, you know, very contracted through VMware directly, where I think maybe Amazon is now too. I just want to look at it, to be honest. But the uh, Azure and the Google Cloud one, you can actually do auto scaling of vSphere nodes if you wanted to, which is where that host retention comes into play. Yeah, and this I think, still to me I think is you the... still had to pay a license <laughs> for the full month. So I don't know why you do it. Yeah. Sorry, Peter. No, that's cool. Yeah, it's still this to me, although it, it sounds clunky, there's so many things running on top of things when you have VMware on top of AWS or Google Cloud. It's such a low friction way to be able to burst into the cloud and then migrate to the cloud when you're already a VMware shop. I really just want the VMware tools. I want the VMware interface so that people who, who know how to use VMware can deploy things in, in whichever cloud they like. But the interface is the vSphere interface or the vCenter interface. And likewise, sure. I wish we could have things the other way around where we could use the EC2 or the GCP console, which normally deploys instances, to deploy instances on-prem or anywhere else in, a, in an actual VMware cluster. I just, I just think it would be nice to kind of pick one place to do the, the instance management from, regardless of... You know, I mean, the goal of hybrid cloud, I guess, is to have one control plane, but it seems like we'd be just adding complexity right now. Yeah, that's a good call out. I love the idea of instead of solidifying on the single control plane, just adding every single abstraction, like not every single, but, you know, like if you could have your cake and eat it too, where your VM, where, you know, IT shops were used to the interface that was managing it locally. And then conversely, those teams that are, you know, modern and DevOpsy using the same, you know, controls and compliance things were just leveraging their existing API methods. Be kind of sweet. I mean, Terraform kind of allows you to do a little bit of that with that abstraction, but not quite. I remember um, Eucalyptus back in the day was trying to mimic the AWS APIs to basically make it so you could run your internal infrastructure using the same APIs used for AWS. So you're basically saying you want the VMware APIs as a layer to basically VMware, you know, to EC2 or Google or Azure based infrastructure, which is interesting. I don't know if they've ever actually thought about that, but that's interesting uh, Trojan horse as well. So if anyone wants to upvote my PFR, I requested that as part of the ECS Anywhere functionality, that they actually provide some mechanisms so that we can do auto scaling of on-prem ECS clusters using exactly this kind of tooling. Oh, nice. That's cool. So contact your reps. I'll put my yeah. request. <laughs> <laughs> So the next announcement also caught me a bit by surprise, very similar to the scheduled auto-scaling one. And this is that Google is introducing cloud domains, an easy registration and ability to manage custom domains. And I thought to myself, Google has to register already. And they do, but it's in G Suite. (laughs) And so it's not part of the Google Cloud natively. And so now they've kind of bridged that gap. And so Cloud Domains is now in preview for you. Cloud Domain leverages Google Domains, which is the G Suite version, their own internet domain registration service as a registrar, resulting in a wide range of registrar features throughout Google's domain management console. If your Google Cloud app requires custom domains, you can gain a lot by using the Cloud Domains capabilities, including a simplified user management capability, letting you register via UI, G Cloud, and APIs, and offers automatic domain verification based on the user account. 
Domains cost $12 per year and privacy protection is included for free. Although I was wondering if that was included for all domains or just .coms because other domain TLDs are very expensive. The end-to-end domain management for cloud domains simplifies domain management by performing automatic domain verifications and customers using cloud DNS, the cloud domains UI, the cloud domains UI provides easy access to cloud DNS to set up public zones and DNS records as well as enhanced security, including DNS sec configuration through one click and cloud domain support, increased security with cloud IAM permissions, providing enterprise grade access management, as well as integrated billing into the Google cloud billing interface and APIs and G cloud all available to you. I feel like we just jumped back to 1994. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny yeah because i realized i was spoiled immediately you know by having these things natively and then realizing that they probably should have had this for a long time it's crazy i have a great story coming up for you on the oracle <laughs> section here <laughs> <about> <laughs> 1994 you're just gonna love so stay tuned for that if you don't really stick around past the section because you don't care about asia tech stay for oracle section at least <laughs> for uh, this introducing carrier pigeon for <laughs> oracle cloud <laughs> Hey everyone, Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. Foghorn, the promise of cloud delivered. Well, Azure apparently was pretty jealous of those private marketplaces that AWS launched a few weeks ago. And so they are introducing the private Azure marketplace for simplified app governments and deployments. Copying others is, of course, the highest sign of flattery in the cloud space. So the private Azure marketplace is, of course, built on top of Azure marketplace to enable governance of which apps are available for deploying in your company. Apps can be added from the Azure marketplace into the private Azure marketplace that complies with customer policies and standards, and company employees can then easily buy or deploy these pre-approved apps within the organization. Apparently, this is a thing people really want. I just don't get it personally. But yeah, if I was in a mega enterprise, I'd probably get it better, but I, I'm not. You know, I'd, I've worked in a lot of private sector, or public sector, sorry, organizations in healthcare and things like that. They often have like single supplier agreements, whether it's for stationery or computers or office furniture, it could be anything. And whenever I see something like this private marketplace thing where you can lock down and make sure that you only ever get something from one particular vendor, I just see costs escalating because if you can only pick this particular tool from this particular vendor, they can name their price. And now anyone can self-serve, you know, any number of instances running a particular licensed software. It's just a cash cow for anybody who puts things in the marketplace. And as you learned, Amazon's largest revenue growing business is their ads. So not only can you now get those ads right into your enterprise, selling you the more expensive version of the products, you're really set up for success. <laughs> well, isn't the whole like promise of private marketplaces so that you can sort of negotiate your price at scale and then you're sort of in control? Of that Yeah, game? I mean, you definitely get access to those things at Amazon. I don't know enough about the Azure one to say one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like they had that solved already with BYOL, but... Well, in the continuation of uh, copying things that are good ideas, Azure Front Door is also copying a recent Amazon feature with the announcement of the Secure Cloud CDN with Intelligent Threat Protection, which is very, very similar to the Amazon CloudFront bundles we talked about a couple weeks ago. Azure is launching two new SKUs, because I love you know a computer product called a SKU. For the Azure Front Door family, the SKU bundle capabilities together from the CDN and WAF into a single secure cloud CDN platform with intelligent threat protection and simple pricing model. So simple, in fact, they give you two options standard and premium. The standard SKU, which is for delivery optimization, gives you static file website caching, dynamic site API acceleration, global load balancing with fast failover, intelligent layer 7 routing, and traffic analytics and health reports. And if you want the premium SKU, which is they're calling the security optimized SKU, it gives you the stuff from the standard as well as integration with Microsoft threat intelligence, private link support, web app firewall with bot protection, new attack signatures for CRS 3.2 and DRS 1.1, and advanced security report metrics and logging. In addition, they've updated the overall experience for creating and purchasing front doors, including simplified management experience and a new UI with built-in TLS certificate management. And to simplify pricing, they have fewer meters that customers need to plan for with each SKU, including a fixed monthly fee, tiered egress for data transfer outbound, request per second, and ingress fees. And all of this available to you today in the Azure cloud with the front door service. Shut the front door. (laughs) Shut the front door. Premium equals production.
who is going to run a production workload without picking the security bundle? Right? I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do, you know, the, conversely, like, if I didn't have, you know, if this was, like, my personal use or it was a pre-production environment, I do like the fact that I don't have to pay the premium on all this. That is kind of true, like, because a lot of these things I don't need necessarily, like, the advanced threat protection and the feed, you know, the feed imports of that. You know, really all I want is sort of, like, the intelligent routing and to be able to, like, run the analytics to see how things are working. It's almost like the pricing model should be the other way around where they say you get all these premium features included in the price, but we'll give you a discount if you turn these things off. It's like <laughs> you're not paying for security at that point. You're paying for a low level of service rather than paying for security. Probably be easier in a lot of infosec budgets if they did it that way. So instead of standard and premium, standard, which is premium, and degraded. <laughs> <laughs> ultra ultra degraded. Oh, yeah. I bet the, the marketing team would friggin' love that. They call, I mean, they call the one without security features the unsecure version. Like, yeah. 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 You have the standard or the insecure. Yeah, you pick one. Pick your poison. Well, the Azure Image Builder apparently has gone generally available. If you want to build your gold images with the Azure Image Builder, you now have that capability to build Windows and Linux virtual machine images. And you can use existing image security configurations to build your compliant images for your organization and patch existing custom images using Linux commands or Windows Update, because everyone loves Windows Update. So great. Several capabilities include the ability to create and customize secure and compliant V images with global distribution management, patching of existing custom images, hybrid image ability building for Azure and Azure Stack, the Azure DevOps integration for integration with new or existing build pipelines, image creation support for Windows virtual desktop environments, and integration with the Azure VNet activity and enterprise networking options to deploy image builder without public IP addresses. The patching of existing custom images is super cool. Like that's something that I haven't seen in any of the other offerings. So that's kind of a neat. I'm sure behind the scenes, it's exactly as you think. Like they spin it up and patch a thing. <laughs> like it's not that complicated. Turn it back off. Yeah. Just having it sort of <laughs> abstracted and enabled for you is super cool because that is one of the bigger challenges of maintaining a golden image. You know. Yeah. I actually really like the fact that you can build your Windows virtual desktop environments with this too, because that's one of the things kind of lacking in workspaces is you can't really create it with the image factory capability of AWS. You have to actually spin it up, do your thing, and then you can create an AMI out of it but it's not quite the same thing. These are still desktop experiences. It's not true desktop OS, right? Yeah. I think in Azure, it's actually the full desktop experience. It's not the version on top of server, which is because they own it and they can do whatever they want to <laughs> versus AWS and everyone else has to pay special licensing permissions to do that kind of stuff. Well, last week we talked about the roving data centers from Oracle and how that's, uh, you know, we solved, that's how they get data centers wherever you want them to be. They just roll their truck or van up and then they show you. And this week I found an article where they actually show you what the rentable ruggedized servers look like. And so now I know what their data center looks like so I can be on the lookout for these. These devices weigh 88 pounds, featuring 40 central processing units, 512 gigs of memory, an NVIDIA Corp graphics processing unit, and 61 terabytes of SSD for a flat fee of $160 per day per node. So you too can run this anywhere you want to. You have your own Oracle data center in a van in your parking lot for $160 per day. And free candy. You're welcome. The price isn't horrendous, really. I mean, you compare that with the price of the snow cones. It's actually not too bad of a price given the compute that you get. But have you seen a picture of those things? It looks like somebody ordered some crappy case from Amazon, from the Amazon store, not just a regular Prime store, but, you know, the cheap Chinese store that takes three <laughs> months to, to ship you the stuff. And uh, it looks like they've crammed a mini blade into this thing and then put a Perspex window in the front just so you can see the Oracle logo. It's so <laughs> tacky. <laughs> it's like a Wish version of a Pelican case. Yeah, That's exactly. how I describe it. <laughs> <laughs> is we're checking out yeah. our show notes uh, in our newsletter or no, in, the, think... in your Clubhouse layer to check out the picture because that is exactly what it looks like. <laughs> Are you sure that's not the giant from Halt and Catch Fire? I mean, it could be, yeah. <laughs> the giant V2, V3. This is, I'm going to call this the giant V3. It did make me chuckle. I have to say that I I clicked on it because it said ruggedized and I had to know. And then I clicked on it. I was like, yep, okay. <laughs> An old server wrapped in bubble wrap. Good <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how rugged that box is actually. Yeah, it's not be. rugged enough. <laughs> it's a bit I mean, of a... <laughs> yeah i kind of wonder like do you actually have to take it out of the box to use it though <laughs> that would be unfortunate yeah <laughs> that would be that would be a not ideal scenario <laughs> I, I didn't see any pictures of ports on the outside that thing it literally looked like a suitcase it, in two halves that you have to open up it to really does thing. just look like crammed it into a pelican case yeah i assume there's ports on the other side of the thing but who knows and a cover take i would hope that there's a cover right for the plexiglass front but 
So uh, Oracle, you know, being the most hated company in Silicon Valley, well, now Austin, you know, has really decided to write a blog post to partner with the most hated registrar in the world, GoDaddy, to give you a how-to article about how to use GoDaddy and OCI together, which I thought was sort of a weird, you know, article, especially after we just talked about Google Cloud Domains and their fact they have a registrar and all that. And then you realize, oh, Oracle doesn't have a registrar. So this whole article is telling you how you can go buy your domain on GoDaddy and then basically use Oracle Cloud to actually manage your DNS zones and how you can get past the touching the magic button in GoDaddy that says, you know, how you're going to give all your DNS information to another third party and how you can trust that button with Oracle. So I think this is a hilarious article just in general that I want to share with all of you here. And yes, Peter, 9984 did call and they do want their DNS back. <laughs> do, do it. Oracle provides your yeah. private service. Only nine ninety nine a month. Unlimited bandwidth. Yeah, really? <laughs> do, do I get a WYSIWYG website builder with this? Yeah. Oh, it's cPanel. <laughs> yeah. Ah, it's cPanel. <clears throat> yep. Only works with IE6. <laughs> Fortunate for me, I'm on Oracle Cloud. That's probably when I last upgraded. <laughs> I got an email the other day that my instance was terminated on the Oracle Cloud because I hadn't paid the bill. I was like, I don't have a bill. Because I don't have an Oracle instance, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "That's that's a great use experience." That's interesting. I need, I need to remember to shut down my quarter of a CPU with a free instance that I spun up. Yeah, yeah, definitely do that before your credits expire. <laughs> well, that is it for new news. You want to take us to the lightning round, Peter? I would love to. Let's start with Datadog. Datadog has integration with Azure now in public preview, which is really Azure copying the future of making you spend a shit ton of money to use their monitoring tools with Datadog. Moving on, Azure Purview is now available in public preview in South Central US and Canada Central. I was mostly sad about this one that I thought Purview was a cat and that Azure had a cat product, but it really isn't. It's just something for IoT and I was very sad. Nobody uses Azure under my purview. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Good wordplay. <laughs> wordplay. Going for the title. Azure provides a new disk bursting metrics. Because that's what I like to have is my disks bursting that I'm paying <laughs> ultra premium prices for. It's literally how I envision this. Just like the old spitty disk yeah. metallic going, you know, <laughs> there's one. <laughs> there's another. There's one. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Amazon Connect now provides disconnect reasons for voice calls and tasks. <laughs> yeah. What's the disconnect reason? Customer didn't unplug it and plug it back in like I told them to. Mm. Amazon Disconnect will make a much better service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As I would. Only valid disconnect reason is because I was mad at you. <laughs> it's the only good one. I want them to give the disconnect volume of like, like I just placed the phone down versus I slammed it down. <laughs> so the problem is cell phones, you need to get like a slam button on the cell phone so it plays the yes. noise down the, down the line before it disconnects. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Startup idea. So right many there. problems, you know, with modern technology. We can't hear the cars coming, so we're getting run over. We can't slam the phone down and get catharsis that way. Like, what are we going to do? Amazon Redshift Query Editor now supports clusters with enhanced VPC routing and longer query times and all node types. And reading this headline makes me realize I don't understand what a query editor is that cares about the node type. It's a strange, strange It's going to be super <laughs> fun now that I have to wait longer for my query to time out and not work anyway. Thanks, Redshift. But you can edit it once it times out so you and probably not give you any good error message either. Why? You can error out. several times. <laughs> Amazon Elasticsearch service adds trace analytics and a new feature for distributed tracing. The only tracing I care about with Elasticsearch is Amazon killing it <laughs> without a trace. Oof. I don't want distributed tracing. I want it right here. <laughs> oh, consolidated tracing or death. Amazon Elasticsearch service also adding support for reporting in Kibana. Because what else would you use Kibana for other than reports? Like, what was the use case before this? I got nothing lost at the fact that that wasn't this is one of those before. like you know little modules that's off on the left hand side that i don't know what it does it's just an abstract picture they don't bother to find it's not documented thank you elasticsearch i will never click that button 
Amazon RDS for SQL Server now supports always on availability groups for standard edition. <laughs> the fact that this is its own announcement, all I can see is Amazon going to Microsoft and going, please, sir, please, sir, let me make available standard edition always on groups for our customers. They don't have to pay for outrageous enterprise licensing. And Microsoft finally saying, eh, get lost, kid. <laughs> How did they get it, though? How did they get it? This is so great. I, oh, it's awesome. Like if you need always on groups, but you don't want to go enterprise, this is really nice. So I'm glad it exists, but I, you know, it's just so weird that it took so long. Yeah. No, I know companies that jerry rigged high availability solutions to avoid having to pay for premium. What's it called? Premium? Enterprise. 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 It's Not called premium. enterprise. Enterprise. They should change it to premium now that uh, everything it, it, is it premium. It should be ultra premium enterprise yeah. edition. Premium. You can now access Amazon EFS file systems from EC2 Mac instances running Mac OS Big Sur. No big All surprise. I can say is... Oops, oh, 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 yeah. Big competition! <laughs> yeah. Jonathan first. Just, uh, no, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> All I was going to say was it's a big surprise. Oh. oh I'm not going to keep it. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> I want to hear it. It's not particularly witty. I'm like, no surprise you couldn't access EFS file systems from Big Sur before. It didn't exist before. No one just announced it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a good point. Well, yeah, so I think when we did the pre-read of the notes, Ryan made the comment he was surprised this wasn't available because Big Sur runs on the Nitro instances. And actually, that's not true because Big Sur and all the Macs actually run on Mac minis if you recall, which maybe have do have a nitro outside card, but they do not have it built into the Yeah, card. no, I thought it was yeah, I, it's the outside card that I was referring to. Yeah. But I also imagine it's a driver thing because you know Amazon's implementation of EFS and the NFS drivers are special. <laughs> like they're not quite normal. So they probably had to do some testing and validation. And it probably would have worked if you tried it. it. Just they weren't officially yeah, supporting it until now. I know how support works. <laughs> yeah. We don't support it until yeah. we say we support it, darn it, even if it does work. Okay. I'm not liable for that. Mm-mm. And that concludes the lightning round. And in my purview, the winner is Jonathan. <laughs> <Yay>! Nice. <laughs> well, again, we have things coming up. Next week is Microsoft Ignite, which this episode probably is dropping right on the first day of Ignite, if the calendar is accurate. So do rush off to go sign up for Ignite if you're interested in that. Microsoft Build is still no details out there. And Google Cloud Next has no details. So nothing else I know about, but you know, Microsoft Ignite, here it is. Next week, we're not doing a show on that because we decided that we didn't want to take that penalty of getting no predictions right again <laughs> yeah. as we did last year for night. I still don't know what they're going to announce. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have no idea. So hopefully we'll have a lot of really cool you know, items coming from Ignite that we can talk about. And we can say, yeah, I would never guess for that in the, like, in the prediction show. So that's all coming up very, very soon. And so we are looking forward to that. It's been another great week in the cloud. Have a good night and see you next week. See you later. Bye, everybody. Night. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Mm-hmm.